poem, The Short History of Private Life by Will Bresson, we'll talk about. Okay. You can't hear me, you tell me please, or if I am too fast, you tell me also. Dwelling on dwelling. <clears throat> Although not very well known in our country, Bill Bryson is a worldwide celebrity among scientists, journalists, philologists, travelers, and in general among anybody who is interested in anything. Because Bryson writes about anything, which actually means, as you understand, about everything. You could say he is the opposite case of Socrates. Socrates said he knew nothing. Bryson seems to know everything. Of course, they're both misleading. Born in 1951 in the United States, he has lived for many years in England, a country he loves and understands better than any Briton, I should say. He has published books about history, geography, linguistics, travel, science, and architecture. His style as a writer is light, fresh, and witty. His information, infinite. And any of his works guarantees a very amusing adventure, whether it deals with William Shakespeare or with Kurt Bedder. And most important for many of us, a subtle but irrepressible humor pervades every page of his books. Really a great guy. He became very famous in 2003 with his surprising and encyclopedic resume of all that contemporary science knows, or all that contemporary science knew in 2003, and I mean all. The book was a bestseller with quite an immodest title, a short history of nearly everything. This is the book that is probably best known in Spain, Una breve historia de casi todo. And some years later, it was intelligently followed by a children-oriented resume of the resume, a summary of a summary, adequately called a really short history of nearly everything. For those of us especially interested in language, another of his delicious fabrications is a well-documented and extremely funny history of the English language called Mother Tongue, English and how it got that way. In 2010, he published the book that has brought us here, At Home, A Short History of Private Life. In Spanish, the book is called En Casa, and it is published by RBA, RBA. And in Catalan, it is called A Casa, and it is published by La Magrana Editions. He and his family had been living for some years in the eastern English countryside in the county of Norfolk. They actually inhabited an old 19th century rectory in a small, very quiet hamlet. At home is a thorough and enticing analysis of the old rectory where he lived, of each and every one of the rooms of the house, that is a home, of its different pieces, the garden, the hall, the kitchen, the staircase, the bathroom, the bedroom, well, I guess everybody here knows which are the rooms of a conventional house, or almost everybody. As we move with Bill across the various spaces, we read about how they were inhabited, where they were inhabited, when they were inhabited, why they were inhabited, and of course, who inhabited them. There is an overflow of data, anecdotes, surprises, technicalities, and what not about each of the spaces, each in their own chapter. Bryson's intention, as stated by himself in the introduction, is to put under an all-seeing microscope the spaces where, far from battles, kings, queens, and revolutions, our life gradually develops from the first song to the last song. Of course, since it is really a book about life, it includes commentaries about families, food, furniture, Plants, animals, art, health, work, rest, tools, children, death, colors, weather, books, passion, 
light, noise, dirt, money, uh, love, progress, tragedy, fashion, sex, art, vehicles, religion, wine, law, dreams, technology, etc. It's almost amazing that he doesn't even mention at all Alzgosh Uzatura. To put it in a nutshell, it is a great reading, great company. But for us architects, Another deeper reading of the book slowly unveils as we smile and walk with Bryson up and down the house, turning off the lights. In its truer sense, as you know, architecture deals mainly with place, memory and meaning. It does, of course, provide shelter for human activities, since our human weakness, even for those of us born in Bilbao, needs protection from the weather and beasts. But its principal concern, architectures, is to attach a meaning to the places we inhabit. It is no coincidence that in English there are two meanings of the word dwell, dwelling that I use in this lecture, titled Dwelling on Dwelling. To dwell, as you know, is to inhabit. And also, to dwell is to meditate on something. So to dwell, to inhabit, in the case of humans, is to think. Why is this? Why do we need to assign a meaning to the spaces we use and live? Probably because since the beginning, since we were almost apes, we have been, and still are, baffled and unable to understand the very, 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 very strange condition of our being in the world. Probably because we have somehow been damned, condemned, with a very, 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 very strange thing in the whole universe, a conscience. Every one of us exists for some decades, if we are lucky, between trillions of years of non-existence, both before our birth and after our death, which is quite strange. So for us, inhabiting space is not simply a natural procedure, like in the case of butterflies or mushrooms. As our students hear every year, our students, sorry for repeating this, the first Neanderthal who buried his father under a hill to protect his remains from the weather and the animals and put on top a stone or a standing stick was really producing, as you know, a transfiguration of the hill. The place is no more an undulation of the landscape, or at least not only that. It is architecture in its most original sense. It is a place that signifies. In this sense, of course, architecture, however eco-friendly, is radically alien to nature. It is really unnatural. By the way, like most of the noblest creation of mankind, law, compassion, poetry, or wine. Non-human nature, that is, stars, mountains, oceans, animals, trees, etc., is certainly fascinating. But we know that it is meaningless. It is actually violent, cruel, self-centered. And this carries us back to Bryson's book. Because the truth is that architecture and architects are not the only givers of meaning to a place. No, the act of living itself of inhabiting a singular space, like the author's rectory, for instance, silently but steadily spreads significance and, we could say, a kind of soul to that place. As architects, we deal with many kinds of meanings, of course, symbolic, sacred, technical, magic, collective, military, but which of these can compete with the innermost meanings of our domestic life. In one of his many illuminating writings, Adolf Loos, almost suffocated by the aesthetic craze of his contemporaries and fellow citizens, as you know, tells us about some small decorative object, Bibelo, standing somewhere in his grandmother's living room. It was, he tells us, an ugly, pretentious, unfashionable little piece that no cultivated secessionist would keep at home. But 
it was Law's grandmother object. And it had been standing there for decades, presiding over little Adolf's family life. And we can ask ourselves, what kind of proposed meaning or exquisite design can compare to that in depth or in spirit? At Home is not really a book about architecture. It is a book about life, private, intimate, domestic life, it moves and develops in the middle of a very special kind of architecture, the architecture of our homes. The unique theater where the tragicomedy of our lives takes place, our loves and our hatreds, our joys and sorrows, our expectations and our disappointments, our birth and our party. Thank you very much.